Welcome to Module 5 Analysis. This is going to be a long video because I have a number of things to discuss in a little more detail. I want to acknowledge that this module is very step by step and there are a certain number of things happening at the same time, which kind of makes the module feel a bit disjointed. So this analysis video is designed to provide you with some more clarity. This module was about tying up a lot of little loose ends. I taught you about bonuses. I taught you to find a bonus factory, to find a bonus to go with the primary product. Then I taught you some basic packaging. I taught you about barcoding. I started the module by teaching you about samples. You need to get a sample of the product to test it out using the information that you gleaned earlier on in the research section when you looked at the customer reviews and did review mining of the competitor products. So we may have found some missing product features when doing the review mining. We might have found some poor product performance issues and these are the things that we jotted down and that we also want to start testing when our sample arrives from China. Once we get the sample from the supplier, we can start to see if there are any issues that were present when we did our review mining. Um, we can test the actual product and we can see if the product is up to spec is good quality and is what we were expecting to see. We want to use and test our samples the same way a consumer would that buys from us on Amazon. If we test the item and if it doesn't work, we can go back to the supplier and talk to them about it. We should have samples from more than one supplier and should be testing our samples side by side. I also recommended buying some of the competing items and testing our sample against those to get a feel for how our product performs against what's already selling on the Amazon market. You can also perform what Amazon calls a three foot drop test. This will ensure you test that the product is packed strong enough for shipment from Amazon to the consumer. I talked to you in the module about the cost of samples. You might get an MOQ and then a cost price from a supplier that is, let's say for example, $5. And all of a sudden, the sample cost might be $50. Well, that's perfectly normal because they may have to do a single run for you to get that sample, or else they may be running out of samples that they have and they're gonna to have to replace them in the future. So you'll be charged for samples and sometimes the price might seem high compared to the MOQ price. The freight costs of shipping the sample using a courier can also be expensive. Even if it's one kilo or half a kilo, you're going to be paying somewhere in the region of $50 to $60. So expect to pay somewhere between $100 to $200 for your sample, depending on how many you're after as well, as where it's going to, um, also the terms of the particular supplier. You can have your sample shipped by a courier like DHL, FedEx, UPS, because it's the easiest way. I get asked by a lot of people, how do I get an account with these couriers? Should I get a freight forwarder to do it? Well, getting a freight forwarder involved here is a little bit of overkill. Um, I also taught you about paying for samples. One way is PayPal, which is a very simple way of doing it if the supplier accepts it. But not all suppliers will accept PayPal. Uh, when you do an international bank transfer, there's going to be a cost for that. But this is a normal business cost. Whenever you look at the overall cost of your sample, it pales into insignificance compared to the cost if you get this product wrong by not sampling it. You need to see it, you need to have it in your hands, you've got to do your testing on it. The cost of getting a product and supplier wrong is very high. Let's say for example you order 200 units of something that's $5 and you don't do a, a test of the sample. So you end up paying $1,000 and you ship it to Amazon and that's not right, like there's something wrong with the product, maybe it's poorly built. This could have been prevented if you paid the $100 or $200 for a sample. You should plan to sell this product for three, five, or 10 years, who knows? So you should be prepared to make a lot of money on your products over that period of time. So you need to invest a relatively small amount to make certain that your $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, or whatever investment is safe and secure. It's really a no-brainer, it's insurance. So the next order you do, you don't need to get a sample because you've already seen the products and you're now dealing with this supplier. 
You can ask the suppliers politely when you make the main order if you can have your sample fee credited back. Some suppliers, not all, will credit back the cost of the sample when you make your larger order. But of course, you won't always place an order when you've got a sample. At, the, at that stage, some of the products will not pass and you'll have to put a line through it and move on. If a product sample doesn't pass your test, you have a couple of options. Option one is go back to the supplier and say, this, uh, you know, this was not correct, there was something wrong with this sample, can you make that correct and, and can you resend the sample? And that's, that's one way you could go. Another way you could go is you could say, I'm just gonna move on from the supplier, the item's not quite right, it's not worth my time and effort sticking here and working with them uh, whenever I have maybe another sample of the same item or a similar item from another supplier, that's perfect. Obviously, in that case, we would go with the better supplier. But if everybody's was not really up to your spec, you would work with that one that was the best quality. You would actually speak to them about that. If a sample doesn't match up, you could go back to the supplier and ask, do you have a higher grade of this product? Do you make something which has a thicker layer of steel or metal? Do you have something which has a better hinge or a higher quality of plastic? Just go back and ask them because they are the ones with all the products and they may very well have one sitting there that they didn't discuss with you because whenever you're dealing with factories and if you're looking at a product which is say $5, they completely discount the fact that they might have one that's $5.40. It's not always about getting the lowest possible price because the supplier will make something according to that price. So you could always lift the price if you get a better product and you still make enough profit. Let's talk about product bonuses. So I've discussed bonuses already in the previous analysis of the modules so far. I'll just touch on a couple of different things to really be comprehensive in this part of the program. And so when it comes to bonuses, the first and most important thing that I've already mentioned, but I'll say it again, is you wanna think about what is the customer using the core product that you're gonna sell for. So if it's gonna be a barbecue grill cover, they're gonna be using that to cover their barbecue. We know they have a barbecue as a result of that. Therefore, we can start to say to ourselves, well, I should give them a bonus to help work with their barbecue. You know they have a barbecue, you also know that they like to take care of their barbecue, they're covering it over. So dig in as deep as you possibly can and that will start to unearth some really good bonuses for you. Another good way of thinking about bonuses is actually using Amazon. You can look at the, the items that are frequently bought together where you can see things that are connected or you can go down through and search for accessories for that product or accessories for the primary product. So for the barbecue cover, the primary product would be a barbecue. So you go down and look for accessories related to barbecuing and that will give you a good list. But also start to think a little bit outside the box. I don't want you to become creative, but I just want you to think, who's my consumer and what would they like to go along with this if it was included? And bear in mind that your bonus is gonna be 10% of the cost of the product. So if your FOB price is $5, you've got 50 cents to spend on a bonus item. You need to be realistic because let's say the barbecue grill cover costs $10. Well, we now have a dollar to make a bonus item. So in that respect, we need to be thinking, we can't get something half decent, but it's not gonna be something world shattering for a dollar. Um, it's just not gonna be a product that would sell on its own. I would take that bonus cost once you've confirmed it, put it in with the original cost price of your primary product your actual item that you're selling, add these costs together, and that should now become your new FOB price. Go and put that back into the Google Sheet and make sure that you're still on course for 100% POI or profit on investment. We wanna make sure that we've got that wiggle room. Take the cost, put it back in, make sure you're still okay, and then move on forward with that particular product. If your bonus costs $1.10 in that $10 example that I just gave, that's okay as well. There's no problem whatsoever. You just need to take into account what that cost will mean for your POI. I also want you to start fitting the bonus product into the same packaging as the primary product. You need to think about that. To source your bonus product, you can ask the same factory that is producing your main product if they can produce the bonus. Whether they can produce the bonus or not, 
they might have a sister factory to make it and send the bonus product to that main factory. So they can package the bonus and main product at the same place and then you're dealing with only one company. That's really what we want. If the main product factory can't produce the bonus and they cannot source it, then you can source the product and then you have a couple of options. You can connect the primary factory with the bonus factory so that they can cooperate or you can arrange separately to buy the bonus from the bonus factory and have it shipped to the primary factory. We can confirm with the main factory that they can do the combined packaging for us of both products. Now I discussed understanding what type of investor you are. So let's say you have $10,000 to invest and you're going to be a cautious investor or a conservative investor. You're going to invest $3,000 of that as your available capital. That doesn't mean you are in a situation where you must spend all of that $3,000. Let's say the MOQ on this product is 1,000 pieces at $3. So if we went with that MOQ, we would be investing our entire $3,000. However, if we can negotiate the MOQ to 500 pieces, then you have a minimum order value of $1,500. You could then buy another product at exactly the same time with the leftover $1,500 that you were going to invest. Now you have two products in the game at exactly the same time. I taught you a very powerful negotiation strategy and budgeting strategy. And if you put those together, you can establish a good business with multiple products. I taught you how to take your $3,000 investment. And if you do your mathematics correctly, you're going to turn that $3,000 into $6,000 in anywhere from you know, the next six to nine months after you sell the products. So it's not like you're spending and you're not going to see any returns. We will. You will see the money back as long as you've done your profit fundamentals that I taught you correctly and you've followed the intelligent sales machine process. So you've got to remove any fear at this point and place your orders. I've seen some people who are afraid to invest the money because they feel like they're never going to see it again. I was feeling the same way when I first started. And I did my, you know, when I did my first Amazon orders. I want you to have confidence in this process and make sure you watch the videos again if you're unsure about anything. You are going through a lot of pieces in this training program to make sure you're going to sell the right product for you at the right time. You need to see your investment as fuel for your business. You're going to fuel your business even further by getting products into stock. If you don't have products, you don't have a business. It's as simple as that. So choose what type of investor you want to be. There's no right or wrong answer. If you're cautious, it's going to mean it's not going to mean you're wrong. If you're aggressive, it doesn't mean you're wrong. It's just a matter of preference for you. Back when I started, I was a pretty conservative investor. This is because I didn't have as much experience or knowledge about what I was doing. I was learning. You were learning as well. You were building up your own knowledge base. But by investing in this training, you're getting a huge shortcut. You're getting 15 odd years of my experience given right to you that you're learning. You're getting all the biggest shortcuts that I can possibly give you. So you've got, that, you've got to have that confidence in that, you know, understand that you are not a complete newbie, believe it or not. So choose whatever investor type is right for you, but know that you're not wrong whatever you do. If you hold on to that investment that you're going to make for the next six to nine months, it's going to stay exactly the same and not grow. Whereas in the profitability fundamentals, you learnt how to double that with 100% POI. So we're going to double the $3,000 in the example I just gave you to $6,000. Now, budgeting is a simple process, really. All we're doing is we are looking at our amount of capital and then we are saying, what products are available to me that I can do? We simply then want to start picking the ones we can do after having negotiated the initial trial order that we're going to do, which is below MOQ. And then let's just say we have the $3,000, $1,500 of that is in our first order. We now know we can do our second product at $1,500. We know we have that available. So if we can negotiate that down further, great. If we can do three, better again. You know, If we can do three at $1,000 each, all the better. So it's a matter of just picking off your best opportunities, seeing if you can get involved in them, getting below MOQ, and then looking at what you have available next and moving on. So if you can invest all $3,000, invest all $3,000. However, if you find that you can only invest $2,500, you've got $500 left over. That, that's no problem. 
keep it in your investment fund. It's not like you've stopped researching. You're still adding more product opportunities to your research pipeline. Whenever you decide what sort of budget you're going to have and what sort of investor you're going to be, these are not fixed in stone. You can start off as a conservative or cautious investor. You might change as you go along. As you get more and more confidence in your selections and everything else, you might change investor type. You might become a little bit more aggressive. In time, your capital fund will grow. Try and see what you can do with that. Can you increase that? Because the more options you have, the better. You're gonna be able to get involved in more and more products and you will always have more opportunities than you will have capital. There's no doubt about that. Look at the number of products there are. Look at the number of products you now have in your research system. You now have more opportunities than capital. So with the trial order, the lower the MOQ, the better. If you can get anywhere from 30% to 60% of the MOQ, that is great. You're gonna reduce your downside if you can reduce MOQs. And your downside here is not very serious at all. Once you've done your homework correctly, you can be in a situation where if worse came to worst and for whatever reason your product didn't go like you wanted it to go, you can simply reduce the price and get rid of it and you haven't lost any money, but you've got a lot of experience. In our experience so far with intelligent sales machine members, those that follow the process don't end up in this situation. Those that didn't take my advice on 30% to 60% MOQ negotiations ended up maybe with just too much stock. It's not like it will never sell. It's just they bought too much because they took the MOQ when they actually should have said, that's not right for me. I'm going to move on because I cannot negotiate the right percentage levels for me. So in this module, I taught you about getting over this hurdle of placing the first order. And I'm helping you to do that by lowering the cost of items that you're going to invest in. Even if that requires taking a slight increase in the FOB or XWorks price, do it. That's absolutely fine to take a small increase in price. It could be a 10% or 15% increase to the factory. If the factory says, no, we cannot move on MOQ, you could offer a 10% increase in your price for the initial order. The factory might agree to this because they see you are building a long-term relationship. You can also say to the supplier that you're gonna come back for more product because it's a test that you're gonna do on Amazon. You know in future, the lower FOB price that you'll pay when you order the MOQ. That's what we wanna base everything off. We don't mind taking a slight increase in price for the first order because what we are essentially doing is we are buying data about the market. When you know 100% for certain that your products are selling and you now have started to see why they sell, when they sell and how many will sell, you will have absolutely no problem going back to your supplier and ordering more to fulfill that demand. So I taught you some advanced negotiation in this module. As you progress with Intelligent Sales Machine and you go into some more advanced programs in the future that really aren't relevant right now, but will be as become a more advanced seller and investor, you're gonna look at things like negotiation in more detail. You're gonna become more advanced in different areas of the business. But for now, you've got more than enough knowledge to get yourself in a position where you're able to negotiate and do well and keep yourself in a good position. I taught you about branding. It's very simple for me and my business. I like to keep branding simple. A lot of people get hung up about the brand. How would I create a brand? I don't wanna create an elaborate brand. I wanna apply a generic, simple and straightforward brand to our products that fits across many different categories. I'm not telling you in here that you must stick to a range. If you do your first product in garden and home, then you don't have to stay there. If you do your first product in sports and outdoors, you don't have to stay there either. I encourage you to explore the marketplace because there are so many product opportunities for you. Cherry pick the best and most profitable items. That's what a business does. A business selects the most profitable things and tasks that it can do. You're gonna be no different. So in terms of branding, keep it simple. I taught you some examples of surnames, places that you know that are local to even, or even, even kind of remote to you. Keep it a coined brand. Think of a fanciful name that's not already out there and doesn't relate to a product. That's the most simple explanation about branding that I can give you. Whenever you come up with a very simple, fanciful name, it just works and it will work forever for you. 
You don't need to have a marketing team come in and design logos or anything like that. Keep that simple as well. You can always expand. Your business will evolve. You've got a packaging evolution. You've got a branding evolution. You don't need to get involved in trademarking and stuff like that straight away. You can look at it and get that sorted a bit later. In terms of packaging, it's similar to the brand philosophy. We want to keep that very simple. I understand this does fly in the face of what a lot of people may say and teach in other training programs, but that's because we have a different strategy here. Our underlying strategy is a rule of five style of business where at its core, we're selling multiple products in multiple countries. The point is that we're not looking for this huge brand that sells 100 products a day in each of the different parts of the product range. So your packaging should be simple. It should be as plain as possible and it should be packaged as close as possible to the soft packaging option I taught you about in this module. We want our packaging to be functional and by functional I mean according to Amazon's guidelines that we stay inside that. The packaging is really designed to protect the product on its journey from the factory the whole way through to the customer. That's what we want and we don't want to go outside that requirement. If we look at the MOQ, we negotiated down by 60% and we are ordering, say, only 300 units in the first order. The cost per piece to design high quality, full color packaging would take a lot of our profit away. We want to be profitable right from the very start. You can bring in your initial order and when you go back for a second order or a third order, then you can change the packaging if you want to. Then you could put some money behind it because now you've got numbers. Now you know this product works and you know to what level it works at. You can see exactly how many you sell per month. So if you need to put some money into increasing your packaging, you can do it at that stage. I smile when I hear people say, the packaging will increase your sales. We're selling on Amazon FBA and the packaging is not in front of the consumer. The Amazon customers don't get to see it until after buying it and it arrives at their house. If you had a fancy box around your item, it doesn't necessarily mean an Amazon customer is going to know and care about it. Or if it was a gift, maybe that's a different situation. But a lot of the items we're, we're going to sell are not really going to be gift items. They're going to be very simple, very boring, highly established items. So in terms of the type of product I taught you about, when you're using a poly bag that you must have a suffocation warning there. As a business owner, you wanna be monitoring what Amazon's requirements are and make certain that you're within those requirements at all times. I've recorded videos that are accurate at the time of this program, but there may be additional things that happen over time. Amazon may change certain things. Amazon is your go-to place for all these requirements. In the videos I gave you the thickness in millimeters that Amazon requires for your poly bags. Stick to those. And you can even go with extra thickness if you like. If it increases the cost slightly, change your FOB number so you can see a true reflection of what you're paying and the profit fundamentals. Don't try to fudge your figures or manipulate any of the numbers. Put the correct numbers into the Google Sheet that you're being charged. When communicating with factories about product features and materials, they will sometimes say things like, oh, that would be expensive. You should ask questions to find out the actual costs. You may find that a supplier will say that by increasing the thickness in millimetres of the poly bag that it would add you know, a dramatic amount to the cost, but that could only be two or three cents. So you've got to get real numbers from your supplier and don't let them say something is costly when it might be worth the extra few cents. Now, I taught you about product labels. I taught you about the barcode. There are two different types of product barcodes, the UPC or EAN. I sometimes get asked which one is better. Well, neither one is better. UPCs used to be used pretty much only in North America, whereas EANs used to be mainly used in Europe. Now, now they are both global, so therefore there's no real difference between the two. So now we have our barcode, and that is unique to each product. And the ASIN is also unique to each product. The barcode, that belongs to us, but the ASIN is Amazon's way of having a unique identifier for all products. When you're purchasing barcodes, I recommend in the video going to nationwidebarcode.com. There has been a lot of talk about GS1 and how you need a GS1 originated barcode. 
don't go to eBay and buy barcodes because they may or may not work for you and might be barcodes that are owned by somebody else. I taught you about inner cartons and outer cartons and it was all very technical, all very step by step. Your products will determine the size of the boxes and the factory will more than likely have boxes for these products. The factory will have packaging, they will have boxes. You can ask the supplier at the factory to do different things to meet Amazon's requirements. So let's finish by talking about actually placing the order and then speaking to our freight forwarder. One of the big errors people make is the fact that they do not speak to a freight forwarder immediately after they place an order. I'm getting you ready to move into what I call phase two of the intelligent sales machine system, where I'm gonna be teaching you everything about logistics. We're still in the last bit of the research phase. So I wanna congratulate you because you've done a great job in completing phase one of the intelligent sales machine program. At this point, you should be in a position where you're ready to place that order. I'm now gonna bring you through orders and logistics in phase two of the program. You should still be in a position where you're going back again to the search phase and adding to your product pipeline by continually getting more products in there to grow your business. Because as you can see, products can whittle down very, very quickly. So that's it for phase one. And I'll see you in the second phase of the Intelligent Sales Machine program.